All right. Well, thank you. I'm talking with Maestro Michael Stern, the music director of the Kansas City Symphony Orchestra. So it's a it's a pleasure and an honor, as I mentioned, to to get to speak with you and really looking forward to it. <laughs> That's all right. I makes a good reminder for me too. Uh, uh, I love to classical see, music. Yeah. Ultimately, what's led me to wanting to talk to you is that I love classical music, and any chance I can um, have to, to talk music with anybody or about any kind of music, I I really relish that. And my goal through my blog over these years has just been to to talk about music and get people interested, and hopefully to bring people to classical music, which is my my ultimate passion. Even though I like any other many other forms of music as well. And so as I talk with great artists like yourself, it helps people maybe learn from something they didn't know or want to listen to something they haven't listened to before. And that's really why I do this, just out of the love of the music. Um, my first question is going to be maybe uh, off, the, off the wall a little bit, but I, I live a lot of my life through sports metaphors. So I think I know the answer to this, but are you a sports fan? Uh, it depends on which sports, but yes. So what, what sports are you a fan of? Well, being in Kansas City, if the Chiefs are in the Super Bowl, you're going to watch the Super Bowl. I don't necessarily watch football every Sunday, but I don't think I've missed a big Chiefs game in the last few years. Um, and certainly last year uh, was pretty exciting. So Absolutely. this year was a little disappointing, but there it goes. Uh, I do like basketball, but I like tennis a lot. I watch tennis. Okay. Now, of now course, if the Royal, yes, of course, if the Royals are in this World Series, I'm going to yeah. watch it. I don't spend a lot of time watching regular season sports, though. I will admit that. So where did you live when you were 10 years old? Because I think that's kind of where we as people become really rabid fans of whatever team, you know, maybe in this our world. Is a big, this is a very sore point because I was a Yankees fan and my brother was a Mets fan and ne'er the twain shall meet. You know, it's a little bit like the Yankees and the Dodgers just transplanted. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I mean, I like the Mets too, but definitely New York city. I, I, I was unbelievably into the New York Knicks when I was a teenager, not so much the Jets and the Giants, but certainly the Knicks and the Yankees. Well, and the Knicks, the, the Knicks had those great runs with, with what, Walt Clyde Fla Frazier and, uh, Oh, Willis Reed, Willis and Walt Reed. Frazier and, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Dave DeBusher. I, I'm telling you, I knew all their numbers. <laughs> 22 from the side with that special jump shot where he came up with the knees that was amazing yeah they had a, they had a great uh, little dynasty at that time so and then as far as football giants or jets for you did you have a... i mean i have no religion on that subject all right well anyway it's good to know because like i say i draw parallels be in music between uh, sports or pull from sports as well so all right, first question, uh, baton or no baton? Why Why either way or neither? What about you use a baton? I do. Um, I why do. and why do others not use a baton? And does it matter? I think baton technique is real. It's not, so if you're gonna, if you're going to hold a stick in your hand, but basically conduct with your wrist or your elbow or your head or anything else, which is not clear, then it doesn't matter. But I was taught to make the point of the stick the orientation because it gives you so much more efficiency and clarity with a minimum of effort that you can easily transmit clarity. And then when you want to diverge from that and make a big gesture, it means something. But if, I mean, if you're... Pardon the pencil. Yeah, that's okay. If let's say you have a, a one, a two beat, one, two, one, two, I'm not even moving, right? And then, and any any musician gets used to that instantly. First of all, let me say, there is no absolute in this, and it's all nonsense to debate it. And okay. I get a little tired of people getting, you know, very didactic and and preachy about it. Preachy about <laughs> yeah. it. So. But I do think there are, um, when you look at somebody like Leonard Bernstein, who was known for his theatrical emoting, 
and he's all over the place and everything is moving and he's dancing and he's jumping and so forth. Lenny had great ears and if something was not together, he instantly would stop and do this and then it comes together. So there was a certain theatricality to him and there was a certain sh showmanship, but he was a superb conductor. And if you look at people like Fritz Reiner and if you look at people like uh, well, I don't know, there's just too many to, to, to say, right. Carlos Biber, all of the expressivity, all of the, of the possibility was not in any way diminished by being clear, right? Um, I think the beat should be expressive always, but you need to do it in such a way that transmits the intent of the music and not the only the metronomic requirements. So this just gives you an incredibly efficient, and especially if you've got more complicated music, contemporary music, meter changes. If you're doing one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two it's so much better than this. Now, mm -hmm. if you're going to conduct like this, one, two, one, two, you don't know what's up, what's down, and you're just holding the stick, it doesn't matter. But if you use the point of the stick, then it does matter because, like E.E. E. Cummings, who knew perfectly well when to capitalize something or use a period or use a comma, the fact that he didn't made it possible for him, when he wanted to, to insert a comma and have it mean something, right? So if you've got this as your basic vocabulary of gesture, it doesn't preclude you from just going all out. But if you're jumping around all the time, people will stop listening or looking, and then you're stuck. Less is more. I like that. So I think a lot of people that don't know classical music, they see this guy on the, on the stand waving a baton. They don't know what is going into that. So. I'm always fascinated by why is it or how is it, what's the, the voodoo or the magic where if you could have the same orchestra, um, you have conductor number one, conduct, conductor number two comes up, conducts the same piece with the same orchestra and have a completely different sound experience. How is that possible? What's going on there? There, there is a little bit of sort of unspoken psychic chemistry. I think it, there's also a question of trust. But it also depends on what your philosophy is. Um, as a human being, right? So aside from the fact that gone are the days where some less than empathetic bullying person on the podium is barking orders at people, which for me completely contradicts the spirit of making music you're gonna have a certain reaction from those players. Yes, they may play well, but they'll also play unhappily or they'll play um, unwillingly. Making music is not an act of submission, it's an act of commission. So, and it's also an act of, of participatory communication. And I, and you have to also believe that the people that you're working with, not that you're conducting at, working with, playing with, are incredibly experienced, musical, sensitive, intelligent, and aware people, right? So for me, the job of a conductor is to create the environment, the atmosphere, the moment, not only in which everyone wants to participate, but one in which they can do their best and also that we're all listening for and going for the same thing it's a little bit like the the old analogy of you're not going to get to where you want to go unless everybody who's supposed to be in the boat wants to be there and is rowing in the same direction so you don't rehearse by saying you made a mistake you're too loud you're wrong you say we have to be together here because listen when the oboe has the solo and you come in underneath there, if you're a little softer, we'll hear her, and then the clarinet can come out of that, and look how beautiful it is, because we're going from A minor to F sharp minor, and that F sharp is, and then all of a sudden people are listening for that, ensemble problems go away, balance problems get resolved, because they're listening for the right things, and they are participating in the phrase. 
I always, always, always think, where are we in the phrase? Where are we going? Right? So a lot of rehearsal time is getting that shape. I, it's not anybody's job with a professional orchestra to teach people how to play. And in the Kansas City Symphony, the level of playing is so high. For sure. You don't need to. It's insulting to think that you need to teach them how to play. We're just trying to put the piece together. And it's not, oh, they don't know how the piece goes and you know how it goes. Because when we do the same Beethoven symphony in 2015, 18, and 21, they're going to sound different. It's just at that moment, what is this music doing? But it also has to be based in what is in the text, right? So, mm -hmm. so three things just to, to follow up on from that. Um, number one, you know that famous cartoon, The Bugs Bunny, where Leopold's coming to the podium and Leopold, Leopold, are there still those authoritarian or you know Toscanini, Carion guys out there, or is that is that era over everywhere now, or does it still exist? Dead and gone. And that's a good thing. Very I think good. as a player myself, who've, you know, experienced a little bit of that, I, I, yeah, I'm glad that's over. Pierre Monteux, who is a great conductor, French conductor, said, a good conductor should always admit his mistakes. He should have said his or her, but in those days there was no such thing. Right. A good conductor should always admit his mistakes and he shouldn't make too many mistakes. But the idea that we are all human and vulnerable and I mean, there is no such thing as um, perfection in music. You're just trying to, it is, a, it is an artistic expression of shared empathy and compassion and communication. That's it. Mm -hmm. Pierre, speaking of Pierre Monteux, I never got to see him, but my favorite death and transfiguration is Pierre Monteux with San Francisco, I think in the early 60s, perhaps, but he was great. He was great. Um, so you mentioned, you know, musicians and this collaborative process, this commission. Um, obviously, and you have great musicians at this at the Kansas City Symphony. If you have an open, when you're curating or building an orchestra, an organization, and, and today there are thousands of great musicians just everywhere. You can go on YouTube and any Instagram and see people shredding instruments, any instrument. It's incredible the level of talent that's out there. And if you have 300 people that want the last chair cello uh, for the Kansas City Symphony and they can all play the notes, how do you find that one person that's going to be part of the musical family and fit your vision and be part of that effort. Uh, uh, what do you look for and how do you find it? Well, we have been very, very lucky at the Kansas City Symphony in our audition process. Um, I think because we take it so seriously and we are unimpeachably fair, but all, am I allowed to use the word unimpeachable anymore? Unimpeachably <laughs> fair, but I, I will be the first to admit that everybody's auditions, including ours, are imperfect because you can either get more information and try to make more of a determination, but you're taking away the fairness of it, at least that part of the fairness that is now based on anonymity, or you're, you know, choosing in the dark and then you have to wait and see through the probation period how it works out in terms of how they fit in the orchestra both musically and as colleagues but I, and you're absolutely right our job is helped by the fact that the pool is so deep the, that there is so much talent but but auditions are brutal because yeah you do have scores if not hundreds of people competing for the same one position and and then it's not completely unheard of that somebody stays in that job for 40 years. So, you know, more and more highly trained people are coming out of conservatories and, and schools, and there are fewer and fewer jobs, not only because there's a set and finite number in the orchestras that we have, but the music world is getting more and more competitive and tighter and tighter on money. So opportunities are being made and I, I, I have great optimism for the future in this regard by these young people especially who are realizing that to make your way in the world with music requires 
vastly more imagination and entrepreneurial uh, go getedness than in the past, and they're doing it. And that's the way music is going to continue to change the world. I'm not saying that it's going away, but the orchestra world is competitive. Now, in auditions, I mean, there's certain, we do, in Kansas City, we do all our auditions behind the screen, even the finals. In some orchestras, they take down the screens, at least that you can see, you know, and then brings in questions about making your orchestra more diverse, making it more gender diverse, race, race diverse, and so forth. But also, um, you get a sense of the play. I mean, if you see somebody, if you're a string player and you see somebody playing in a way that's awkward, you know that that may be a problem. And if you see somebody who's really beautifully set up, you think that's, so that part of the decision process is out, right? If, if one of our brass players, our expert blast brass players were to see closely somebody who's auditioning um, and they notice something in their embouchure, they notice something in their technique, Maybe they would have an opinion, but we don't see that. So we, it's all based on what we hear. And I am very proud of the way we manage auditions because we don't listen for, can you just play the notes? You don't, my, my general rule, and I say this to young people all the time, is when I'm listening to somebody, especially behind a screen, I want to hear them play that excerpt, not like they just extracted 14 bars from Death and Transfiguration, but they're playing the piece. So if they can insert themselves into that piece, even though they're only playing their part, and um, make us sound like, make us feel like they, if they were sitting with us playing that piece, that they would know exactly what they're doing, that's a huge credit. And then the other thing is, to continue what I said before, they need to show where they are in the phrase. Obviously the technical things matter, if somebody plays out of tune or they can't control the bow or they can't control their tonguing or they can't control whatever. Um, but, you know, we... we and, and sometimes the choice is really clear, right? Because you hear somebody from behind the screen and you think it's yet again a, a, an excellent performance. We just heard eight of them. But this person is an artist. And then you, your ear... Your ear doesn't... I mean, you have, to, you have to be responsible. You can't come to the auditions super tired or dismissive or, I mean, you're choosing somebody who may outlast you for a long time. Certainly as the conductor, a lot of the players who auditioned during my time are gonna be in the Kansas City Symphony for decades after I'm, we've hired some very young people. <laughs> but, um, but I think, it's the musical message. When somebody speaks to you from behind the screen in a way that captures your attention and demands your attention, then you know you have something special. Too long an answer, sorry. No, a great answer. I'm, I'm not in any hurry. This is great. So, uh, and certainly I'm here for whenever your time is up, just let me know. Um, but I have a question that I, to that, along along with that, so you're selecting, the Kansas City Symphony, I think, is a great, a great symphony, and I love going to hear concerts. And I, I, I understand as a kid growing up that there was the Big Five was kind of the standard for the United States. Those orchestras, is that really the case anymore, or is it just everything is leveled out now, and there is no appreciable difference between Philadelphia and Chicago or the Kansas Cities and the Nashvilles? On any given Sunday, right? Any NFL team can can win. Can you be the best symphony orchestra in the in the country on any given Saturday night or whatever? Well, I'll 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 say first of all with great confidence that the idea of the Big Five is ridiculous. Yeah. Because there's there there's too much talent again around the country, and mm -hmm. it's just I mean, you're going to tell me that San Francisco or Los Angeles are not major orchestras, right? So it's only Chicago, Philadelphia, Boston. Chicago, Philadelphia, Boston, New York, and, and Cleveland. Mm -hmm. That said, I was the assistant conductor for five years in Cleveland. They're pretty special. The Philadelphia Orchestra is a magnificent orchestra. The New York Philharmonic, Boston Symphony, I mean, 
These are great orchestras, right? Mm -hmm. Virtuosic orchestras. They can do anything. Do they do anything or everything on any given night with perfect regularity? No. So I'm a little bit fed up with the dismissiveness that comes with, oh, yeah, it's a minor orchestra. It's just Kansas City or it's just Milwaukee or it's just, you know, take, take your pick. Okay, sorry. Um, no problem. So can, just consider this, Tim. The Kansas City Symphony, when I took it, was, I want to be politic, um, less than it is now. For sure. Not only in the level, but in its importance for the community, its resonance in the community, and also um, its budget. We were hovering around, I don't know, $12 million or something. We were definitely in the middle to lower end of the group two orchestras and not particularly distinguished, I'm sorry to say. Mm -hmm. Long history in Kansas City, since 1932 and then again in 1982, but we are now a group one orchestra. We are financially more stable than almost any orchestra in the country. We have an incredibly loyal base of audience and subscribers and we play like we play which is unrecognizable from when I took it over so if there's one thing that I can say you know I'm proud of the work that we've done together but I'm certainly proud of the way the musicians um, have reacted I mean look what we've been doing in this COVID time yes it's been mostly strings only we're starting to inter intersperse some wins because of the contagion factor of aerosol droplets and so forth but um We've gone through an enormous amount of incredibly difficult repertoire on very little rehearsal, with a lot of social distancing, with masks on. I mean, it's insane. Mm -hmm. And they sound great. They so, do. So I, I also firmly reject the idea that our national musical landscape can survive with five mostly East Coast-based big musical centers. It's nonsense. First of all, music is not just Eurocentric or symphonic centric. There's great music happening across the spectrum. And you can go to every single corner of every single little place in, in the entire country and find great musicians, like you said. Not just orchestral musicians auditioning. Musicians, right? Um, in every genre. So as a musical culture, and especially if you believe as I do, that it is inconceivable that we can have a healthy educational system or even a healthy society without a shared musical experience, then the idea that there should be these centers of excellence and everybody else gets the, the crumbs is nonsense. And I would say that there are orchestras with much bigger budgets than we, who don't sound as consistently good as we do, as we can. We, we have to earn it every time. And that's another reason, you know, it's a little bit like, you know, the Avis, we try harder thing, but it's also, we're not complacent. We're not complacent, complacent in our administration. We're not complacent, in, complacent on stage. We don't take anything for granted. And we have one of the most enlightened and informed boards of any place that I've ever seen, and I've seen a lot of them. And I think that that makes an enormous amount of, of difference. I give huge credit to the board, starting with the way Shirley Helsberg shepherded us, then Bill Lyons, who was unbelievable, and now Pat McCown, all of the directors, and the way they are complicit with us in wanting excellence and preserving you know, the stability of the orchestra, but also the, the meaning of what music can, can do in the community. And then, of course, you know, 19 years with Frank Byrne was transformational, and I was honored to partner with him, and now we are in a new chapter where we're only looking forward. You know, Danny Beckley started two years ago, and, and um, my goal always, always, was to leave the orchestra, whenever that was, better than when I found it. And 
now that end of the tunnel is, is sort of in sight, but it's not there yet. And I promise you, right now, what is it today? March 15th, 2021? Correct. The orchestra is not as good as it's going to be on the last day of my music directorship. Um, do you have time for a couple more questions? Sure. Uh, so, that, drawing on a sports parallel, you know, like a golfer maybe or a tennis player, there are times, or a baseball pitcher, they go out and normally they do their thing, and it, especially if they're great, it seems easy and they they have a good outing. But there, uh, I've heard Sandy Kopex talk about. There's those couple starts a year where even he took them out and he didn't have his best stuff. He couldn't find the strike zone. Those are the starts where he said he really learned how to pitch. When you got to grind, you got to right. throw your, your original playbook out the window. So have you taken the podium? And when you do in these situations where you don't have your best stuff or the orchestra doesn't, and you have to grind, how do you get through that process? Or does that happen? Uh, well, what do you mean by grind exactly? Well, I, I think they just mean that like if you normally are going to do A, B, and C, but you can't you can't go basketball, <laughs> football, you got to go change up in something else. I mean, I, as a music, maybe the you're, you're not hearing each other well, or maybe the, the this doesn't feel right, or the tempo got, uh, 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 I don't know if you've ever started a tempo that you didn't mean to start uh, uh, down that way, and now like, oh, shoot, we're going too fast. Have you ever had to adjust? In a performance or in a rehearsal? In a performance. <clears throat> yeah, it, sometimes it happens, but the, first of all, we are human, right? So you aim for a tempo. Sometimes you're a little tired. Sometimes you're a little excited. There's a little more or less adrenaline. There is this incredible buzz from the from the audience, which gets you jazzed up. Whatever it is, um, and there are look. There is the domino effect, and sometimes there have been very few and far between. But one little thing go, going wrong begets another little thing going wrong and before you know it it's like holy shit it's like Wah! um but then the the inverse is also true which is you've done the friday performance and you come on saturday and you're in the exact same spot and for some reason that hush of the diminuendo and the beginning of the oboe is like whoa and that inspires you to do something a little differently. So you zig and zag. In terms of tempo, the, the, the ability, first of all, you have to be a good enough conductor and a good enough player to be able to react quickly. And I think we are. And secondly, there's trust, right? So if there is a moment where things are a little behind, and if you push, you know, a, a really great conductor never slams on the brakes or s steers the, the steering wheel abruptly to the right or jams from second to third gear. There's always this kind of, right? And you see this kind of uh, give and take, which is always on the breath. So my, my philosophy of conducting is, yes, gesture is important. And I was very lucky to have an extremely good pair of teachers who taught me very different things, but they were incredibly complimentary. Well, they would, they, they all taught the same, they both taught the same things, but one emphasized one thing more and the other emphasized the other thing more. That was Max Rudolph at the Kurtz Institute of Music and Charles Brook for a few summers when I went to study with him. And Rudolph was all about hearing and being able to get flow and, but a lot of it was technique. And Brooke, who had a very good technique, but a completely different technique, it was not wrist-based. Wrist, a wrist technique is more efficient. Again, because when you want to do a big gesture with your arms, you're not, but if you're always gesturing with your arms and your head and your body, nobody listens, right? So if, you're, if you whisper and all of a sudden you shout, the shout's going to get attention. If you're shouting at somebody all the time, they stop listening. It's the same thing with gestures. So I have a wrist-based technique. Brooke did not. He was, it was a lot of arm but he was breathing all the time. And whenever, as young conductors, which we do, did all the time, things were not together, 99.7% of the time was because we were off the breath. If you can bring people, even 100 or more people together on the breath, 
nobody has to guess. You know exactly where and why to, to, to play. So if in a performance something is a little off with the tempo and so forth, and you start to slam on the brakes and jump into, you know, from fourth gear down to third gear because it's too fast, you're going to have a train wreck. If you take a breath and bring the breath back into the right tempo, you're fine. You, I'm, I'm amazed when I talk to musicians sometimes that tell me that, you know, they, they play music, they practice, that's their life, but they don't listen to music when they're not working. Do you listen to music for enjoyment anymore or still? I do, but not a lot of symphonic music. What, I mean, what I, listen, your... I listen what... to symphonic music when, um, when something interests me or when I'm, I'm, I never listen to the two pieces I'm performing ever. I even am loath to listen to performances that I did of previous because I, I don't want to be influenced by past ideas because you pick up the score and you're looking again and, and trying to figure out what does this piece right now say to you. Mm -hmm. But it's always what is the piece. Say? My teacher had a perfect way of saying it. It's like you don't young conductors or vain conductors of any age open a score and say, OK, what can I do to this piece that will make it about me? Mm -hmm. And he said, what kind of a disrespect is that to these people who wrote music that, right? So he said, I open a score and I see what is this music doing to me and why is it doing it to me? So that's a good rule of thumb for me. Um, and so I don't listen to a lot of symphonic music for those reasons. Um, I went through a lot of Bach listening, solo Bach playing and, and even, uh, piano music at the beginning of COVID just because it was a solace. Uh, I listen, I've got two daughters, 12 and 14 years old. So there is a fair amount of non-classical music happening around me, which I'm desperately trying to catch up on because, you know, the eye rolling that comes with dad being out of touch right. is more than I can bear. So um, right now, at least as far as I can tell. It seems like Taylor Swift moved into my daughter's bedrooms. <laughs> That's all I hear. Right? Um, and and I revisit performances. I would say chamber music and not enough opera. Although my brother is an opera conductor and he sends me stuff that he he's he's worked on. I don't know. It's a little bit all over the map. Uh, but it. I would agree unless there's a specific reason or a young person wants me to listen to a performance of theirs or somebody, I remember this incredible performance. You know, you mentioned the death of Tra and transfiguration with Montu. For me, the three big Strauss tone poems, the sort of gold standard was the Zell Cleveland recording. But it's also because it's such a miracle of orchestral perfection and incredibly beautiful. Mizell had a kind of aloofness and distance, but in that music, it was, I mean, it pins your ears to the, to the back mm -hmm. of the wall. So, so I, it, and it depends on my mood. Mm -hmm. And I, will, I would be lying if I said there are times when I would not, I would just turn off music and not listen to music for a little while just to clear my head. Did you uh, did you do any binge watching or you have any guilty uh, binge watching shows uh, during COVID on Netflix or anything like that? I will confess that I I watched The Crown avidly. We did too. And, oh my God, yeah. Um, what else? Um, not a lot. I will say not a lot. Um, not because I felt like oh it's a waste of time. Not at all. But there was some unease, I don't know, I felt a lot, especially at the beginning, I felt a lot of unease. And the anxiety of not knowing, just sitting there and watching something passively, I just, I couldn't, I didn't have the patience. I did, unfortunately, I, I will freely admit to this terrible weakness and uh, it's, it's actually an illness, that I consumed news in an unhealthy amount. I was obsessed and saddened by what is still going on yeah. in our country. I had to turn off a little bit after January 20th and just let things 
cool off a little bit. Because mm -hmm. I do worry for our country. I think, though, whatever is going to happen, we're going to have to figure it out because we cannot, this is untenable. But I do think that the arts and, and music has got to be somewhere inside whatever answer we come up with. Because it's, the, it's one of the, the ways that keep us connected and keeps us human. I agree. I, t I turned off, I listened to more music this past year than I probably ever have, which is where I go to find that comfort. And Good thing. You ever pick up the violin anymore? Once in a while, if I'm bowing something, I would do it. And I, when when my daughter was still studying the violin, my, my both my daughters are very musical, but my oldest one is really into. I mean, she taught herself the guitar really well. She's been making extraordinary progress on the oboe. They both studied the piano. My older daughter stuck with it, and she started with, on the violin and was really doing well. But she didn't want to play, which of course for me was a little heartbreaking. But um, she goes back and forth between piano, guitar, oboe. They both have lovely voices. They're singing all the time. Uh, so when she was studying the violin, I would practice with her a little bit. Now, less so. But um, I don't know. I can see a double, a Bach double, the violin oboe concerto in my future with her. So maybe. maybe. That would be awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Well, one more quick one or two quick ones. So I'm always concerned about people's health in the music world. So I think I'm always wondering, being a conductor is a really physical job. You're, you know, and I'm wondering year after year, what do you do to stay in shape? And do you notice like, oh my God, you know, three, you know, all these rehearsals and every service year after year is harder on your body. And are you noticing a change as you get older that you have to adapt in a certain way? I'm noticing a change as I get older, and I don't think it has anything to do with conducting. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, none of us is getting any younger. Right. Um, I, my big regret in COVID is not exercising more because I had the time to do it and I decidedly let that slide. And mm -hmm. uh, although I must say my cooking and baking skills got much, much better. Because I really, I took, well, I took, I took, the situation very seriously in terms of the safety for me and my children and being divorced my kids go back and forth so I had to be very careful so I spent a lot of time in the kitchen with them and in preparation for them to come back um, let's just say we ate more than we exercised okay. at least you ate well but yeah. I think I mean there is a certain stress management that you have to have when you're in a professional life um, it was I tell you though it was kind of a revelation not to be on a plane every week and not to, I mean, I was home more and, and home more with them than I ever had been. And that's a gift. Absolutely. What about your hearing? You're right there with this sound coming at you all the time. Does it, do you wear earplugs? Does it ever hurt your, you go home and have ringing in your ears? From a rehearsal? From a re rehearsal or from a, a performance? No. No, I know that there, there are real issues for musicians on stage if they're close to very loud orchestras. You see some orchestras with plexiglass shields around them and so forth. Um, on the podium, you, I mean, when something is truly too loud, you, you balance it and it, it sounds bad in the hall, but it's not, I mean, I should, there, are, there are examples, there, there are pieces I once did. <laughs> not in Kansas City, we haven't done the piece yet, but there's a wonderful piece actually, but it's extremely noisy by Edgar uh, Varez called Amérique, which features an air siren in the middle of it. Oh, wow. Which is extremely loud. That's a little painful, but normally no. That's good. I, I, I have some degree of it and I've always just, I feel like, um, when you're in a hall like Hellsburg, the sound is perfect, but it seems like it's also, you hear everything. So I'm glad to know that's not an issue. Um, and you're a coffee drinker, not, do you drink tea as well? When I, I can drink tea, but I am definitely, definitely a coffee drinker. Do you make it with a press or with a Keurig? How do you get up and start your day? How do you make your coffee? Okay, so for a long time, 
I was I, there was French press and there was also uh, I actually had a espresso machine. First, the old barista one where you you know do it yourself, and then mm-hmm. an automatic one, and they're fine. I don't like the plastic waste. I don't like the foil waste. I don't like the waste. Period. Mm-hmm. And then I got a Technoformi Mocha Master. Mm. It kind of changed my life. It's still pour over drip coffee. It is absolutely the best coffee I've ever had. It's not the most expensive machine that you can buy by any means. It's mm-hmm. not the cheapest either. Um, it's incredibly consistent. You need a good burr grinder for sure. Mm-hmm. You need to grind fresh every morning. Yeah. But the but the Technoformi Mocha Master is so fast that from filling the water in the machine, grinding the beans, and having a full pot takes about seven minutes. And it's great. I also have a Chemex pour over, Mm -hmm. old fashioned, very old school. Mm -hmm. You do what you gotta do. But you know, when when the need is great and you're in, you know, on a 15 hour drive and you stop at a gas station somewhere, you're gonna get the coffee and you're gonna drink the coffee. It's terrible. We'll drink it. It's coffee, yeah, nonetheless. So, well, listen, I, I won't keep you any longer. I've really enjoyed having this opportunity to talk and uh, hear what's going on with you. I can't wait for live performances to happen again. Any any thoughts about any guests or hints when that may be? Well, we are absolutely hoping that September is going to happen. We sort of understood that we were not going to have audiences this year. We tried to formulate some plans to get them going wasn't going to happen so um we're planning a full season next year we're going to have you know guest conductors to start looking at possible music director candidates we're going to have great soloists i'm going to try to recoup as much of the programming and the guest soloists that we lost in this year um just move, and, and if something really goes south over the summer with spikes and surges, and mm-hmm. we'll deal with it. But you know, I think I think it's it's somewhat of on the one hand, it's a tragedy and embarrassment the way we handled our response to COVID, mm-hmm. and there's a lot of blame in some very specific places to to think about. But it's sort of silly to look backwards, and at the same time. It's kind of amazing that these vaccines came to light in the time frame that they did. So yeah. you have to give credit where credit is due. There's never been a situation like this, and it gives me hope for the next pandemic because the next pandemic is coming because right. the environmental effect on our human population and on our planet is eroding our ability to fight these viruses. <laughs> They're... They are dispassionately uh, unprejudiced. Right. In who so um, it gives me hope that we will be able to weather the next storm. But I think um, I think that we will come out of it, and we will have this season next year. I hope so. I hope so. Well, thank you very much for your time. I wish you all the best. I look forward to seeing you on the podium again, whenever that is. And thank you for everything you've done for, for the uh, orchestra here and the community. It's, it's just been amazing what you've done. Well, you're very kind. And I do look forward to welcoming you back in the hall. And I look forward to reading the blog. Absolutely. I can't wait to get it ready. Great. Thanks. Have a great day. You too, Tim. Thanks. Appreciate it. Bye. Bye.